our creation story tells of a balance, a way of knowing that earned our place with that which was always here. We came into this world imperfect. We came here to learn how to be in this world. From our places of origin, we travel through this land from far north to the south, to the west, to the east. Our boundaries of this land were sacred and the mystical experiences helped shape our form within it. All wisdom comes from the land, from lived experiences. In later generations, we made relationship with one another through diaspora and time-honored traditions with other tribes. We welcome the stranger, the explorers, the missionaries, the settlers, and the descendants, and members of the Métis Nation as well, as well as every newcomer. This has not been a good history for a lot of us, each bringing a different understanding, a different testimony, and a different way of life. In these lands, the lands of dreams and sacred stories, where we once learned how to live with creation, we struggled to live with one another, especially when the tables were turned and prejudices were acted upon. Today, as we struggle to restore our balance with the environment and the story of the land, may we hear the wisdom of this land anew as it continues to teach us how we must live within it to survive. In our tradition, um, from my people, the stony people, we burn a smudge from the plants we gather in the mountains, the mountain sage, the sweet grass, and other different elements that we use to cleanse and purify, and to offer our prayer to the creator. We believe the smoke carries our message to the creator. And so we gather here, we gather here as a reminder of our connection to the earth and of those around us. So we pray, as our ancestors have done <clears throat> from time immemorial, at the beginning of the day, as the sun enters the world, the light of the world, knowledge of the world, we take time to remember our connection. Creator God, one who abides with us, who guides us, who offers us love, and nurture in this space. We give thanks for your presence in our lives. We give thanks for your understandings that have taught us to live in this world. We give thanks for all parts of creation and a reminder of our connection within creation, that we are a part of it. We are meant to help in our way as stewards as ones who learn the ways of nature. So for these things, we give thanks. And when we have overstepped our bounds, we beg for forgiveness. Where we have done wrong, we beg for your atonement. We know that we have much work to do in these days if we want to leave a place that is wholly nurturing for the next generations that come. We have much work to do to change minds, to change perspectives. We pray that you would be with us in this work and for those that travel to be with them as well and their safety to return back to their motherland. Jesus Christ, Amen. We will begin uh, with a our first panel, which will be uh, here with uh, Teddy Stringer, who is a. I'm going to introduce the uh, the person who will introduce the panelists. So Teddy Stringer is a from the Métis Nation of Ontario and a vice president of development and peace for the Montreal Diocese. So Teddy, please uh, take it away. 
Taddy, can I jump in before you start? Um, we're having a little issue with the Spanish interpretation. Um, Paulina, could uh, are you able to change your mic a little bit so that uh, the folks can hear the Spanish better? Thank you. Go ahead. Is that is that better now? We're good now. Thanks. Well, uh, for the first panel, we have uh, three three wonderful participants who are going to be delegates to COP. Uh, 27, uh, two in Canada and one, I believe, in in the Philippines at the moment. Is that? I, I hope that's that's correct at the moment. Um, with in in Canada, we have uh, Tia Kennedy, who is the youth delegate as well as indigenous delegate. She's a very experienced uh, for, for, uh, indigenous climate activist uh, leader. She has international experience, including exchange with indigenous people in Peru and has spoken at, uh, <laughs> and has spoken at uh, events in, including uh, the Global Women's Forum in Paris and the Right Here, Right Now Global Climate Summit. Uh, she's working for the Assembly of First Nations as a po policy analyst and also uh, working on a short film highlighting her family's connections to the, the devastating water crisis in First Nations. And we're very lucky to have her. And also in Canada, we have a, sorry, a, Clifford Musquash, who's Anishinaabe from the Pogwashing, I'm sorry, I, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Pogwashing or Pays Blood First Nation on the North Shore of Lake Superior in Gichikami. He is completing a master's in public health with a specialization in indigenous uh, and northern health at Lakehead University, Thunder Bay. He is uh, committed to advancing social justice for indigenous and LGBTQ plus people in Canada. And he is also an extremely experienced Kairos blanket exercise facilitator, has alongside more than 2000 participants. He will tell us there's something about that perhaps in a minute. And in uh, Philippines, one of the global solidarity partners of Kairos, so we have Paul Belisario, who is the Assistant Global Coordinator for the International Indigenous Peoples Movement for Self-Determination and Liberation. His work focuses on campaigns, mobilization, and outreach on the theme of liberation movements and right to self-determination, land rights, climate justice, and food systems. He will be representing the Indigenous Peoples Movement for Self-Determination and Liberation, IPMSDL, the Global Indigenous Peoples Delegation to COP27. He's also agreed very kindly to join the Kairos delegation to lend experience and expertise working Indigenous rights and climate change issues in the Philippines. So those are three wonderful delegates who will be answering the discussion of why is it important to put Indigenous leadership, Indigenous history Hi. and knowledge, up, sorry, at, at the center of climate action. And so three general questions, as each one of you can, can answer all or, or one as you choose, would be why is it important that indigenous leadership and history are at the center of climate action? What would this look like? And how does the Kairos blanket exercise relate to this? Um, so there will be questions afterwards. Please put them in the chat. I think probably without the questions, about maybe five minutes-ish to begin each. Uh, or, and I don't know if one of you would like to go first or... Nobody would particularly like to go first. Um, I can. <laughs> you would, all right, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Buzhu, I'm coming to you from Thunder Bay, Ontario, on the North Shore of Lake Superior, the traditional territory of Fort William First Nation, who were signatories to the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850. Um, I'm excited to be a part of this delegation. Um, 
So to answer the first question, why I think it's important to center Indigenous leadership in history and climate action, um, I think, firstly, it's important to recognize that Indigenous people globally uh, have always been environmental stewards. We have always, uh, you know, I can only speak to the Canadian experience, but um, I know for myself, our people have always been environmental stewards and have lived off the land and uh, have cared for the land in ways that left enough for future generations. Uh, very long-term vision. Um, we, we lived off the land and, and used its resources in, in ways that were very sustainable prior to contact, even during and after contact. Uh, and I think it's, it's important to remember that, um, that the climate emergency that we're in right now uh, has really come on the heels of industrialization and the commercialization or commodification of natural resources that are found in our lands and our, our waters. Um, so I think it's important to recognize um, the, the steadfastness of global Indigenous peoples in caring for the land that we're in. Uh, this is our land. For the Anishinaabe, uh, such as myself, um, we understand ourselves to be part of that land and, and part of that water very physically, um, not just spiritually. So we see ourselves as extensions of land and water and land and water as extensions of ourselves. So what's done to the land is done to ourselves. So I think when we look at addressing environmental issues, I think the approach could dramatically change if the people who are developing policy and legislation and programs or developing industry, et cetera, um, would do it very differently if they saw the land as being a part of themselves. And the work that would then come would be health focused and sustainable and uplifting and it would bring people together and it would be equitable. So I think that those are the lessons that we can learn from our global Indigenous people. I think that that's part of the message that we can bring forward as Indigenous delegates to COP. And that's part of what I'm looking forward to um, being able to do. Um, what would that look like? Well, it would look like having Indigenous people at the table, being part of the conversation, being part of solutions. This has always been our land. It remains to be our land, even though cities and communities across the country are now where our traditional lands are. It's still our land. So um, the transactions and the activity that is done upon that land, we still have a vested interest in. So when we look at centering Indigenous leadership and history in climate action, it means having Indigenous people at that table. It also means having Indigenous people uh, lead those efforts or, or going off of, um, you know, their intentions and, and their objectives in how they see, uh, you know, activity uh, needing to be done in a good way. We are the people who can bring that knowledge and help uh, teach and show non-Indigenous people how we can care for the land. And we have always done that. So I think that it's important to recognize that place and that role for Indigenous people in a contemporary or, or current context. Um, and how can the blanket exercise uh, relate to this? You know, I've facilitated many, many exercises as you had indicated. Um, the way that I describe the blanket exercise is, you know, it's, it's a story, it's a walk through history, but it's not just a history lesson, it's geography, it's politics, it's environmental science. Um, our people were scientific and numeric people. It didn't always look like uh, the Western understanding of science and you know numbers, but our, our people were scientific and numeric, um, just in a different way. Um, and, and those lessons are all uh, contained within the blanket exercise. So the blanket exercise is, re is a really good starting point to uh, for conversations about how to move forward. Um, and so I think that that's how we can use the blanket exercise as a tool to have these conversations about Indigenous leadership and centering Indigenous history in our uh, actions towards uh, climate change.
a minute. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Sorry, Stephanie, you're muted. Sorry. Um, uh, thank you very much. For, I, I think Paul would like to, to speak next and, and then Tia, and I'm sure there will also be questions. And I was wrong. Um, uh, Paul corrects me. He is in fact already in Egypt, not in the Philippines. Okay, hello everyone. Am I, am I audible? Yes. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, good afternoon here from you. I'm actually already here at the conference center in Shamel Sheikh. I was here uh, a bit earlier to attend uh, the facilitative working group on of local communities and indigenous uh, peoples under the UNFCC who are meeting before the official start of COP27 and together with the other IPN SEL networks and partners, we are here to observe and to participate on the pre-COP meeting of the facilitative working group. And I think uh, it speaks a lot on uh, the discussions ongoing here. Uh, I just actually stepped out of the meeting right now to meet you all. Uh, the, the, the meeting centers on the discussion and how indigenous knowledge uh, should center on the discussions uh, addressing climate change on uh, the capacity of indigenous communities to engage in the policies and programs that the parties are forwarding. And of course, uh, for them to be able to be at the center, not only on the crafting of such policies, but to be at the center also when it is implemented to have safeguard and guarantees that when these solutions uh, that are made are done, in consideration of indigenous people's rights to their land, to their ways of living. And I think that the very reason that why indigenous peoples, the very reason that indigenous peoples uh, should be their history, their very existence should be at the center of the climate discussion is basically it is them who have first, the, the indigenous values that they have sharing the values of uh, communal sharing, the values of using the resources not just for themselves but for, but for the future generation, the value of uh, using the resources not only for their communities but for other communities, the next uh, communities that will use it and how they relate uh, on a spiritual level to, to the environment is the very antithesis of the system that have caused the, the big problem that we are facing now, uh, using lands, using resources, uh, extracting it, uh, encroaching uh, the territories for uh, personal, uh, personal interest and uh, prof profits and, and the gains. So I think uh, that's why uh, the, the, the contribution centering indigenous peoples who are uh, at the very at their very core are climate heroes because they are the one who has been protecting uh, just like what Clifford uh, have shared uh, protecting our planet ever since and again uh, they have been our the, their legacy of fighting uh, encroachments the colonial structures and colonial legacy against uh, those who encroach their lands and, and conquer them which happens now in a new different level is again, a very, very important contribution on the discussions of uh, climate solutions. And I think uh, this has been uh, still a challenge. Uh, there, there are a lot of hurdles. We, we are moving forward in terms of uh, making opportunities and space to hear them but again, uh, COP27 has been labeled as the COP of implementation. And its implementation of what we're talking in the international level will still be based on how it is applied on the local, on the national. And on that level, I think there's a lot, still a lot of challenge on how parties and states uh, report on the contribution of indigenous people, how they really create an environment where indigenous peoples 
can voice out, can defend their, and live their knowledge, practice their culture without fear of being attacked, being vilified, being called enemies because they just want to protect their waters, their rivers, uh, their mountains, and uh, the, the, the environment that they, where they lived for centuries. And, and I haven't personally been experienced the blanket exercise, and I'm very much looking forward, but based on uh, our networks, our partners who have been uh, told stories and how it is done, I think uh, my takeaway is how the blanket exercise not only engage indigenous peoples, but also non-indigenous peoples, which is very, very important because as we know, indigenous peoples are a very tiny percentage population of our planet. And they really, we really, really need a lot of solidarity from different sectors, non-indigenous advocates for to amplify uh, their, their fight because they themselves are just a very tiny percentage of the population and the solidarity that the blanket exercise, I think, builds is very, very much useful of value on really forwarding the voice, centering the voice of indigenous peoples, their knowledge, their solution in addressing and ultimately fighting uh, climate change. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Paul. And so next to Pitya, um, who mentioned indigenous voices are often not heard, could probably add to that, um, women and youth voices are not heard often. So uh, I would love to hear what Tia has to say. Yeah, thank you. Manogajab, um, good morning, everyone. Buju, Ganoque Indigena Kaz, Mangandora, Bakish Gonan Donjaba, Anishinaabe Kwandao. It's really nice to be here on this panel. I think um, everything that Paul and Clifford said, I'll probably just reiterate in a different way. Um, I'm really excited for the blanket exercise that we'll be facilitating in Egypt, um, bringing people together in a good way. That's always um, a really good opportunity. Not only that, um, but I think what my goal is to accomplish through this, through COP, COP27, is to shift mindsets. And so we've been focused um, through Western society on a hyper individualism or hyper individualistic mindset. And we really need to shift that to think about how we can be in relation with each other, be in relation with Mother Earth. And I think this is a really interesting period because this is happening um, while things are reopening after COVID. And if we can learn anything from COVID, it's uh, the interconnectedness that we have with each other, how quickly that virus was able to spread. We really are so, so interconnected as people. And so um, that's one thing that we were able to learn from that. And now this is the time that we can um, really implement that knowledge that we learned and to think about our interconnectedness as people and our interconnectedness, not only as people, but with the planet as well. Um, so our animal relatives, all the medicines, our plant relatives. Um, and in terms of indigenous peoples and indigenous history, I'm really looking forward to being able to share our stories, our teachings, because those all give us instructions how to be in relation with the earth, how to be in relation with each other, uh, even within our languages, uh, being able to share that. Those still tell stories and they share prayers and teachings. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that and also hearing from other Indigenous folks globally because it, it, they people that are local have the best solutions and best understanding of what work needs to be done in terms to mitigating climate change. It's really this war that we need to tackle together and the best people to bring and um, support uplift during this war are those who have been impacted by climate change and see the real raw effects every single day right in front of their eyes. Um, so especially within Canada, if we're thinking in the uh, Canadian context, 
81% of Canada's global greenhouse emissions come from um, resource extraction within Indigenous territories, Indigenous communities, and traditional territories. So again, these are the people that are seeing the impacts right in front of their eyes every single day. And then there are also the people with the longest standing relationship with Mother Earth. And so how can we use that knowledge um, in a good way instead of, again, an, another extractive way? We really want to do this in a good way, a meaningful way together instead of constantly from like this extractive model. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. And I think that's um, kind of all I have to add today. Excellent. Thank you very much. Now, you actually, all three of you have 15 more minutes. And so far, nobody has put any questions in the chat. So first of all, probably everybody is still thinking about what, what you were saying. But first of all, I thought I'd ask, would you, any of you like to respond to each other? I think I'll just say I agree with Tia and Clifford. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, I think I'll have to follow Tia's, uh, uh, what, what she's saying on how uh, the extractive model has really uh, affected uh, the many territories of indigenous people and take note these territories are the the some of them are the only our only hope that that absorbs all the emissions that we have and another an, another thing uh, from, from from the work of IPM SDL focusing on uh, the rights of indigenous people their sa safety and security one of the issues that we are really forwarding making it Make, uh, wanting to uh, make it heard here in COP is on how to protect and keep indigenous people safe uh, and secure, meaning their very existence because indigenous people has been making headlines on how of them uh, are receiving the most fatal attacks in Latin America, in the Philippines, most dangerous countries for land defenders, indigenous people's defenders. And I think we really cannot talk about uh, preserving their indigenous knowledge, practicing their contribution, uh, uh, fulfilling their role in climate solutions. If they are criminalized, they are in jail, if, or if they're already gone or, or their communities are in danger, they are in fear of their lives. So again, uh, an, an alarming emergency other than the, the, the emergency of climate that we now is the alarming state of indigenous peoples being uh, at the receiving end of the attacks by different forces, usually related on how do they how they defend their lands. And as we know, uh, their connection to their land is the very root of how they can practice their knowledges and culture. Thank you. Excellent. And by now, quite a few people have actually put questions in. Um, so I think I'm just going to read a couple of them and then you can decide um, who would like, like to answer what. Um, so the first one is, is clearly for, for Tia. Uh, some Mireille Church uh, would like to know if you would say any more about uh, your family in the water crisis um, and also it, like wondered if you have, have your contact information for, for future presentations. You, I think you might put some of that in the chat. Um, Nelson uh, would like, uh, often we get the sense more is better. Will youth uh, lead the way on accepting less consumption, less travel? Um, and a third one here is quite specific, but you might have, uh, have answers for it. Could you give an example of how to change the process of extraction of mineral resources using indigenous practices? Yeah. So there are more, but probably those three are plenty to start with. Yeah, um, so I can start 
with a couple questions um, in regards to the water crisis for First Nations communities. Um, I did create a short documentary. And so within that documentary, I think I'll be answering another question um, when I'm talking about my documentary, but I highlighted um, not only the water crisis, but more in particular, the Anishinaabe relationship with the water, trying to come from a strength-based um, solution with while addressing my uh, addressing the water crisis within my short documentary, um, I got to in interview youth environmentalists within the community, water walkers, um, hunters who have been there for over seventy years and saw the uh, land change over time, as well as um, other local interviews. And so I think there's a couple minutes where I'm in there, but again, this is really centering those local voices. Um, and their experiences. And you can do this all across Turtle Island. Um, so at the Heritage Center on Walpole Island First Nation, they've been doing this work, environmental stewardship work for over 30 years, maybe even decades longer. Um, in terms of like environmental science and indigenous uh, stewardship together, uh, so again, all these solutions are, are across Turtle Island um, and they're they're local, locally based. Um, in terms of, yeah, that's pretty much it. In terms, I just finished filming the last day of my short documentary. So it's with the editor right now. We're hoping that it might get screened at COP if, if we can make it happen. Um, the Heritage Center is on Walpole Island First Nation. So um, yeah, and then in terms of youth leading the way, I, I think that's a great question too. Um, I actually thought to myself before coming to COP, I was like, I've been traveling quite a bit this year. Is this something that I should be doing in person or is this something that I could be doing virtually? So I think our generation definitely has that consciousness and uh, that of self-awareness where we're able to think about all these opportunities and, and what we can do hybrid uh, or what we can do virtually versus what we need to do in person. And I felt this um, experience since it is my first COP, um, it's definitely a good decision to attend in person and see if I can start shifting those mindsets and telling those stories while being in relation. Because again, like Western technology, um, it's kind of binded in the imagination of, of Western thought. And so through this laptop, are you able to get across that relationship um, building like you would in person? So that's why I made the decision for my first COP to attend in person, but it's definitely something to consider um, for future trips. Thanks. Um, so maybe I'll just um, come in here if that's okay. Um, <clears throat> so just kind of in response to Paul and Tia so far, um, what I would say uh, for myself, uh, what I'm really looking forward to uh, being a part of this delegation and, and being uh, given the opportunity to, to meet many different people from throughout the world. One of the things that is exciting for me in this is that we're all coming together under the banner of climate change, climate action, climate justice, but all from very different perspectives with how we intersect with um, that topic or, or that kind of work. Uh, Tia comes at it from a very different place than I, uh, even though we're both First Nation people from Canada. Um, I have a background in health and social service delivery. So I'm a social worker myself. I'm studying public health. Public health as a discipline is very broad. It's not just, uh, you know, water water quality and, and um, you know, restaurants inspections. We look at health on a very holistic level. So for myself as an Indigenous person in my program, wh where we're looking at health holistically, it feels very right for me, right? So within that are a lot of environmental issues and ecological issues. So for myself, that's how I, int I intersect with this material and and these topics so i just think it's really exciting to hear kind of the different perspectives that we come from because i think the broader our understanding of an issue is the better and more holistic 
our approaches and our actions will be following that. <clears throat> There was a question or two in the chat just about the Kairos blanket exercise. I think I saw something in there about logistics, so I'm happy to um, address that. So um, maybe so I don't leave too many blanks, I'll just kind of give a quick synopsis of the exercise. Uh, the exercise is a very participatory activity uh, where participants take on the role of Indigenous people on Turtle Island. They stand on blankets on the floor that are uh, representative of the land of Turtle Island. So they are the people standing on blankets uh, representing Indigenous people on the land. The blanket exercise is a scripted exercise that takes participants through the story of Turtle Island. It's not the happiest of stories. There's some very hard truths to hear in there, um, but it's a conversation starter. Once we all kind of get onto the same starting point, understanding the history of the land that we're on. It can be a little unsettling for people because it really challenges, you know, inner working models and our previous understanding of our country, our history, um, how we as individuals intersect with these issues, this history, this continuing, um, this continuing living history. Um, these aren't just issues of the past. Um, for COP, we are we have applied to host the exercise as kind of a breakout session um, in one of the centers at COP. Um, and so right now we have confirmed one exercise uh, for next week. I think it's on Wednesday or Thursday. The 16th, I think, is what I saw. Um, so that is one way that we are bringing the blanket exercise and the story of, of Turtle Island to the global community. Um, the scripted exercise is about 45 minutes, bookended on the exercise is an introduction and then a sharing circle where we start to talk about and process um, what we have heard and our reactions to that and then talk about what we as individuals or professionals or whatever roles we are taking on, what we can do within those roles uh, going forward to make the future better than the past. Thank you very much. Um, there was also a question that was specifically before Paul. Um, Tony Snow, who, who gave us the, the beautiful opening, would like to know what, can, what people in the global north can do uh, about the, the targeting, the targeting, the criminalizing, the, the murdering, et cetera, of, of activists, of land and rights, uh, water defenders in the global south. Yeah, thank you so much, Reverend Tony. Uh, there's a lot of big help. We, we really need a lot of support and solidarity from the people of Canada uh, and, the, and the global north on these issues. Because when, when we talk about uh, the attacks, uh, most of them are linked on how businesses, big corporations uh, encroach their lands related to the encroachments of their lands, extractions of their resources. and Mostly, not maybe not all of the time. These uh, businesses, corporations are from Canada, from 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 the global north. So, uh, I've, I've I am with some of the members uh, from the Barrick Gold Mining in PNG, a Canadian company. Of course, we are working with uh, the indigenous community in the DPO in Nueva Vizcaya, and again another a Canadian uh, company. So you know. Uh, Indigenous people cannot go to Canada anytime <laughs> soon. They are they live so far. And for 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 the people of the global north to to echo this, to 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 ask accountability on their governments, on, on the companies uh, in your in your own country, to respect the rights, to respect the lands, and to keep the indigenous peoples in in in, in, in the countries where 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 there's an investment, there's a project of uh, of your country is a very, very big help to really expose and find ways to protect indigenous people, even though we are seas miles and miles away from each other. So again, uh, it will, it, it, it is, it, it's actually happening, of course, through Kairos, uh, always there to, to, to help us, to ask us on, on the help that we need. But again, uh, the, the more 
of the people from the global north to, to speak about these issues, the, the better it will be held to, to know to, so that the companies and the government cannot ignore them anymore. So uh, your, 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 your uh, voices, your, your solidarity in, in one way or another, in many, many ways is always helpful. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think that's the time. Um, I've put in the link, anyone who'd like to hear, I, I find a little bit more about the, these people. I've put a couple links in the chat and we look forward very much to hearing what you will have to say after COP27. Thank you so much for all the speakers and, and we wish you well for your journey and for uh, your advocacy in these uh, difficult areas. We're going to turn now to our next panel, which is uh, going to be introduced by uh, Nelson Lee, president of Green Sky Sustainability Consulting in the, with the Mennonite Church. And it is called False Solutions, Including Resource Extraction and Climate Change. So I'll turn that over to Nelson. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, that was a great panel. Um, well, following uh, I, I do work with companies in the extractive industry. So I think this is um, a very, uh, I, I see it as a very current topic. Uh, you know, the context of this panel will be uh, you know, about the, um, the false, maybe the false uh, message that's coming from governments and decision makers saying, you know, we have all these solutions, there's the technology and whatnot. Uh, but is that really addressing the root cause of the climate crisis? Right? Um, personally, I, I think not. And so the panelists we have will will be addressing that. And I'll, I'll put the questions to them uh, as we go along. But um, so first of all, I'd like to uh, and see. Well, we have uh, you, sir. I, I see you're right here right now. So maybe I'll start with you. Um, and. So you're an international student at U of T and you've been working with development and peace and very interested in sustainable development goals. I could go on and, and, and say more about you, but maybe I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and, and just put the first kind of uh, question is, um, you know, what are these false solutions? You know, the, the tech promise, maybe job promises even, and versus, you know, that root cause, like why actually do we have the climate crisis? And, put that to you first. I think I can begin with kind of like the most obvious, I can address the elephant in the room, I guess, um, and that's greenwashing. I feel like that's become such an incredible strategy, really. Um, honestly, I am baffled to see <laughs> how corporations continue to essentially make a fool of us. Um, it has, at the start, I think it was very easy to kind of look through it and be like, okay, they are, they are kind of being dodgy about this, but now these, these solutions kind of sound almost legitimate. Um, there's a lot I can go into. Carbon neutrality, to start off with, um, is a concept that has come under consistent scrutiny over the last couple of months, especially. Um, basically the idea of just, you know, putting carbon into the air anyway, and then finding ways in which to offset it, which I do recognize is necessary for the carbon that we have already put into the air. Um, however, I do think that is one of the most prime examples of what a false solution is. Um, climate justice cannot be achieved. Ecological justice cannot be achieved if we continue to go down this path, um, no matter how fancy schmancy <laughs> um, they, what kind of technologies they put into place, carbon capture, which is exceedingly expensive and statistics have shown that it almost never meets its goals. Um, technology still has a really, really far way to go and kind of um, using that to pacify the masses, I think is, a huge problem. Um, yeah, that's kind of all I have to say as like a cursory introduction to 
false solutions. I, I don't want to go into too much more yet. Uh, I'll save that for the next couple of questions. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great start, uh, Yusra. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I see we're joined by uh, uh, Noble uh, Wadza, and he's a, a coordinator at Oil Watch Africa's uh, Ghana chapter. And they have a, a wonderful slogan, keep or leave, sorry, leave the oil in the soil. So I, I love that. Uh, and, and that's, of course, where it should be. So uh, Noble, I, I, I could tell us a little bit more about you if you'd like, but um, what about that, um, the, uh, the promise of this resource extraction, you know, jobs, um, uh, maybe even looking for um, minerals that, that are gonna be used in, in uh, electrifying, decarbonizing the society. But how does that translate on the ground, like where you are? I mean, what, how does it Im impact um, the environment and, and people? Thank you. I'll turn it over to you. Um, clearly, the first solution is expressed by the dichotomy between how resource extraction is expected to translate into development and the zero evidence of that. Um, the first solution is recently uh, much more maintained by certain phrases, uh, development phrases like investments, investor, particularly the global south, these words are heavily used as doses to, to quieten the masses or the ordinary citizens into believing that anything coming from an investor is good for all. Uh, to the extent that the investor is being marketed by governments as an agency that could not be questioned, such that everything that they produce or they bring or they will bring about is good. So citizens and ordinary uh, community people are reeled into a certain pattern of questions. So they don't question anything about the investor. And this thing is being done by governments in, in collusion with uh, the agencies of capital, those who uh, finance or the bank rule, the companies and the companies themselves have managed to communicate this line of argument so strongly. So uh, there are many levels of four solutions. Some are clearly linked to what I've just said, but there are the four solutions are also uh, uh, marketed on the basis of the very systems that ordinary citizens are contesting. For instance, mining. When mining is affecting communities, forests, rivers, and agricultural lands, then you have a, an alternative phrase, development phrase is sustainable mining. Then it becomes a basis for contention. And most of the times you are made to believe that the companies have the technology, they have the skills, they have what it takes. So at the end of the day, you don't really um, uh, you, you are thwarted in your efforts, or you are, you are you, the, the, I mean, the, the space is stifled for achieving what you want to achieve. Then again, link that, linking all these to development uh, at the local level, uh, we see very little in the global south, particularly from where I come from in Ghana, where mining communities are the most impoverished among the larger segments of society, where oil communities. Uh, and, and nothing to write home about, where farmlands are taken away from people who cannot even meet their daily primary economic needs. Yet, these extractive sector investments are going on the periphery of these communities. People have lost their lands in the name of compensation. And compensation is always one time off. In the name of employment, extractive industries and their cronies in government have been very vociferous in marketing job opportunities, only to realize on the ground that these jobs are false because community people yeah. don't yeah. have what it takes to participate in the industry activities. And at the end of the day, at best, only a few community people will be hand hooked, or will be picked to be working in these industries. And even that, they work at the lower echelons of the staff hierarchy. So 
at the end at the at the job level to community people or ordinary citizens are missing. But on top of all this, you realize that the extractive industry is a political economy industry. It's of interest to the high political class to the extent that we make laws to back some of these things. So it, it begins with a system where the resources are, before it's even get extracted, it is already taken away from the local economy. So they don't have parts, they don't have a part to play in the decision-making whether to extract or not. Local people are missing out there. In the process of production, they are not there. In the process of even revenue, so-called revenue that comes, local people don't receive it, it goes into some states arrangements and in the decision to use the revenue to the another so clearly you cannot develop from what you don't have the resource is already gone it's taken away from them and all the value chain so they don't participate and at the local level to when they are even lucky that some revenues find their way into the local uh, administrative level there too there is elite capture so the grassroots citizens whose resources, whose common resources that we are all talking about don't get to benefit. And we count figures and we are happy, government officials are happy to be mentioning figures like GDP and all that, and all becomes an illusion to ordinary citizens. I like to stay only over here. I mean, there are more to talk about, I'm, I'm sure, when we find ourselves in Egypt, if the time permits. But these are the fundamentals of how local people misses out on all these fronts, job, employment opportunity, the resource benefit and all that. It's just a mirage, honestly. Well, thank you very much, Noble. I hope you uh, find the opportunity to share that voice um, at COP27. And I hope certainly the, the uh, Rich Nations delegates will, will listen to that, you know, how to make that, that work out fair. I don't know if we have, we had another panelist, uh, Chantel, uh, is she here or are you here? If, if not, I mean, maybe uh, she might join later. Well, we can go on, uh, continue on. Um, back to you, so yeah. So obviously you're, you're young, you're a woman. Um, how does that get um, translate to, you know, climate action on the ground? Like, I mean, where, um, how do you see things? So what's your perspective that you'd like to share with us? That's that's a big question, and I guess what I can do is I can start like pretty locally. Um, in the Middle East, there has been a very large push to move women into more policy making, policy forming roles. Um, in the UAE, I believe almost fifty percent of managerial roles are held by women, and um, women make up two thirds of private sector, public sector jobs. Um, a lot of those are directly related to how climate change is being addressed and being perceived by Middle Eastern populations. Um, companies see a large correlation between women-led organizations and the and their sustainability index, essentially. And I think that just goes to show that climate rights heavily intersect with women's rights um, in so, so, so many ways. Um, I'm talking just about the Middle East in this particular example, but if you think about indigenous, indigenous communities in Latin America, uh, we see that again, like we are hoping to see more of the shift in uh, decision-making roles. So a lot of these communities in Ecuador and Peru have done so much for their land, have taken so many steps, have defied societal norms completely and have, have had so many successful endeavors. And we were just continuing to see an increase in that, which I think is absolutely incredible. And they, they are examples to the rest of the world, really. Um, it's, it's great to see, and I hope we see more of it in other parts of the world. Um, when it comes to being a youth and also a woman, um, past COP conferences have minimized 
youth voices and women's voices. I think that is very evident from their agendas. It's very evident from their outcomes. And it's kind of very evident by the way kind of COP was initially presented as, you know, just something for the government, something for the leaders to come and talk about how to solve the climate crisis without listening to the voices of the people who are most affected by it. Um, COP27 this year will be held in Egypt and Africa. Um, in Africa, 70% of the population is aged under 30. They mm -hmm. are the ones who are right at the front of this climate crisis. They are the ones who are being most heavily impacted. So having youth voices is so incredibly important. I think for the first time this year, there's also a children and youth pavilion that is dedicated to listening to youth voices and addressing youth-led solutions and kind of giving them a platform for this. Um, the youth envoy to COP27, Dr. Amneo Lamrani, has done so much to ensure that youth voices are being given a platform. And I've never seen that in the past. Um, it is probably the greatest scale thus far that we've seen youth voices on. Um, I am sure that it's going to be an incredibly emotionally charged kind of day. Um, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of emotions flying high, I think. And I've I've mentioned this at like other speaking engagements and other panels too. I do really think that the day dedicated to youth will probably yield the most productive outcomes. Um, I am a very firm believer in that fact. And I guess it remains to be seen. I'm very, very excited for that particular day. Um, I am also really excited to hear from diverse voices, from diverse youth, um, from all over the world, because I think Clifford mentioned this in an earlier panel and I echo Tia's sentiments exactly. Um, the best solutions are the locals. They have solutions to the climate crisis. And I think that this opportunity is basically phenomenal. I'm very, very excited for it. Well, thank you very much, Yusra. Uh, um, now, just remind everyone that Project Drawdown talks about how to decarbonize. One of the top handful, the top five or so choices is empowering women and youth. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's great. And I just want to remind you too, when you're talking to some of these decision makers, they might look like me, you know, some old guy with gray hair. Remember, they probably have a daughter like you. So that may be their soft spot, right? Uh, you know, um, anyways. Uh, Oba, I have a question for you. Um, I'm not sure how colonization affected Ghana, but is decolonization a, a approach that would, could work in practice? Is, is that happening? Uh, is, is there any potential for, for reversing? You know, you, you talked a little bit about the what's not working, can decolonization work? And, and you know, are there opportunities there? Can, 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 please come again. Okay, uh, well, decolonization, I guess it's reversing that whole colonial process, you know, um, which you described really is that centralized, the rich get richer, you know, the privileged uh, benefit, other, uh, you know, um, the majority just, get pushed away, right? And, you know, uh, make way for the, the projects. Is there a reverse process in place in Ghana? Or do you see that? Or how could that work? How could that unfold? Um, clearly, um, we are at another stage of colonization in the first place. Uh, and to decolonize that colonizing system, um, to achieve a reverse order will call for uh, mass citizen awareness and empowerment. Uh, so it is also the case that 
we are we are under the how do I call it um, the influence of democracy. We are not. We need to use the democratic spaces that we have in a more positive direction into the extractive sector. Democracy is not only about waking one day in the morning and go to vote somebody into power and the person becomes or begin to do something else and you wait for the next four years to take him out. No, I think democracy is expected to, to deliver a certain outcome. And that outcome is not only a political outcome in terms of making choices of people who rule in a particular type, no, but it is expected to also deliver on citizens' needs and aspirations. And for, for the countries that some of us come from, which are resource-based or resource-rich uh, 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 countries, so-called, uh, it is important that citizens, after electing people into offices, continue to participate in the decision-making and choice-making of how their resources are, are, are managed. And that is the way we can decolonize because once we choose people into places who are not talking to others outside the political space from which they have been elected to govern, uh, at times we, you, we don't even get to know. You see, there are so many things happening. We use even diplomacy. People say because of diplomacy, certain things cannot question. You elect people into offices and the next day you hear them talking to some people from elsewhere. Some, are, for instance, I'm not saying so exactly, but for instance, maybe the director of Coca-Cola Global has come to meet the Ghana president. Then you, a citizen, want to meet the same president. You, you, it is virtually impossible for you. And the news media will. Oh, uh, Noble, something happened to your audio. It's just discussions. And that okay. discussion is okay. held under closed doors. Then you ask yourself, what is my president discussing with others under closed doors? Is that democracy? So the whole agenda of democracy needs to be properly interrogated. And citizens must understand the need to interrogate that process and make it more useful to our needs. Otherwise, uh, yeah, no, dictatorship. And I think we need to uh, use the democracy in a way that inures to the benefit of citizens' needs. That is the way we can decolonize the colonization process that we find ourselves in. Yeah, thank you uh, very much, Noble. And uh, maybe I could continue on just a little. You're speaking to probably mainly uh, uh, Canadians. How can we help in that process? Because, you know, we, we um, for example, want to electrify, maybe we want electric vehicles. I know a lot of the minerals may, may come from Africa or some of that, and uh, we're putting pressure on, and, you know, how, how can we contribute? Uh, I think, yeah, one that we find ourselves in the same global community. Uh, well, we, know we are in a globalized world, so of course, uh, those um, countries that have advanced in the course of their democracy um, through uh, agencies like you or Canadian uh, political uh, systems should, should hear our cases, probably through you, we, sh we, we should hear our cases and also amplify the, 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 the kind of challenges that we have, we face over here. Because Canada is a, uh, provides development support to Ghana. And it is important that you don't only provide that development support, but you must understand what that your development could do to citizens over here. And doing that will also mean that we provide information and you amplify our voices in Canada. However, it's done through whatever means. At times, it can be uh, um, skills exchange, exchange tours. Sometimes it can only be a, docu a documentary showing somewhere that is relevant and stuff like that. Great, great, great ideas. Yeah, and hopefully, um, especially us in the church can do a more, more of being a champion, coming alongside and things like that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Noble. Uh, by the way, I just want to share uh, with everyone that um, we were uh, planning to have another panelist, uh, Chantel. Uh, she, unfortunately, she's um, working to get her visa and, and having got all kinds of difficulties and, and internet and whatnot. Um, so, I, of course, these are just symptoms of why is diff, um, I guess one more um, challenge that the developing nations are having to come to places like COP, right? Um, it's a really disadvantage, it's expensive, you can't get the visas, you can't get the, uh, the 
internet's not working. So it's just um, not a level playing field at all. So anyways, we can, our, our prayers can be with Chantel that she can get through that. As a matter of fact, she, she's, she would have, um, she is from the Democratic Republic of Congo and where we know there is a lot of that um, extractive mining going on. And, and um, so keep her in our thoughts there too. Uh, we we'll just have a, a few more minutes uh, going on. Um, maybe I get back to you, uh, Yusra. Um, yeah, what can, what would you say your message to the audience, you know, for the love of um, creation, what can we do to come alongside or to champion, say, the, the quieter voices in the global south? And particularly, yeah. say, women and children. Yeah, no, I, I know Clifford and Tia also mentioned this in their panel, but being given a seat at the table and um, just just more than that, really giving being given opportunities like such as the one that I'm receiving to be part of this delegation, um, being making sure our education systems are really touching upon these themes in a way that is more than just surface level. So like inciting a genuine respect for the environment and inciting a genuine respect for um, ecological crisis and social justice and really getting in and explaining those interconnections. I think that also kind of touches upon one of the questions in the chat. Um, the more aware we are about these greenwashing peace you know, solutions, the more we know about them, the harder we are to fool. And I think when the harder it is to fool us, I think that's when the real action comes out. Um, but yeah, no, being given a seat at the table, being being acknowledged, I think, is also a really, really important step. Um, I do not think IPCC reports have touched upon this as thoroughly as they should have should be doing. Um, again, we are finally seeing some sort of acknowledgement, but I I don't think it's enough. I don't I don't think it's enough. I know it's not enough, and um, it's it's a work in progress. And it's like as a youth delegate for me, it's all it's all about managing my expectations too. Um, Understandably, youth don't have a lot of faith in conventions like the COP. Um, understandably, they do not have a lot of faith in governments. And I think the only way that that can change is collective action. Yeah, thank you. I, I apologize for um, any contribution I have made to, to, to that kind of frustration, you know, from, from youth and, and especially women. Um, we just have a few more minutes uh, and I'll wrap up, but uh, Noble, what if I could uh, ask you a question about, um, you know, again, what more of um, how can we come alongside as a church um, and and support you, give you a greater voice? You mentioned about amplifying your, your um, the message. How how could we actually do that? Like uh, who who to connect with? Um, your organization, others. Um... Mm. Sorry, um, sorry, a call came through, so I missed part of your question. But if I got, I hope you want to say how do we go about what my proposals were? Is that? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, how, how would you go about amplifying your your voice? <laughs> That's a big question. I hope you have to, you have to help me out in this. But I think that. Uh, Basically, we have to produce the voice in the first place. Uh, we have to produce the material that you have to amplify in your meetings. Probably if you do have those meetings with uh, officials, that matter. And um, like I also said earlier, there are instances uh, subject to availability of resources. Uh, we can also create a platform for us as sometimes, like I said, a steady tour. People will have to stand on platform and speak directly to policymakers that, have, that influence our government over here. And uh, yeah, that is also one. And also, we can also do regular. Um, uh, we, uh, we, can, we can we can generate information through research, and, and generate citizen voices and share with you 
and you can also amplify that on our behalf. So, or we can create a, um, a conversation scheme through the web systems regularly and have regular meetings and meet with people just like we are doing here. So I think uh, there are many avenues. Some I cannot fathom immediately, but I think these are just a few that mm -hmm. I can think of immediately now. Great. No, well, so I hope, um, yeah, for the love of creation, Kairos, we can get connected. Uh, you know, we have your contact details and that's, that is a, a call to action, I think, for us, you know, to be the amplifier for your uh, voices from the ground. So I'm going to wrap it up right here and um, turn it over to Tony for the next panel. So thank you very much and thank our speakers too. Thank you also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much for that uh, presentation. I think it's a really important points that were being brought up there. Uh, we have our next panel and our uh, host, uh, Sabrina Shafari, who is the uh, Creation Care Animator for Ministry for Justice, Peace, and Creation Care for Sisters of St. Joseph of Toronto. And this panel is uh, dealing with women, peace, and security, and climate change, conflict, and gender inequities. So turn it over to Sabrina. Thank you very much, Reverend Snow. And I just want to take a second. I'm sure there'll be lots of thanks later on, but what a wonderful job all of our interpreters are doing. I'm absolutely in awe watching all of the simultaneous uh, translations happening in the chat. And I imagine they're happening with audio as well. So thank you, merci and gracias. Um, good morning to everyone and welcome Hannah and Kelly. As Reverend Snow said, my name is Sabrina. And the focus of this panel, uh, we're looking at uh, Colombia, South Sudan and the West Bank, uh, some of the countries and territories that continue to face the impacts of protracted conflict and increasingly the climate crisis. So as we've already seen, we're gonna pose a couple of questions to each of the panelists and then have some time at the end uh, for questions from the wider audience. Now we were scheduled to have a third panelist join us as well, Juan Re um, Rachel Michael Roberto. My apologies for not pronouncing that name correctly, but unfortunately she's experiencing some technical issues and won't be able to join us. I'm sure we've all had our share of uh, those types of instances. Um, so our thoughts are with her. So once again, welcome Kelly and welcome Hannah. Does it matter who I start with? Does anybody have, is anybody raring to go right away? It's still a bit early, isn't it? Hana, you unmuted yourself. So we're gonna go with you. So allow me to provide um, a brief introduction and you're more than welcome to add to it. So Hana Kare is a researcher, trainer and peace activist with YM Palestine Conflict Transformation Center. Like uh, the other women, peace and security partners, Weam is a long-term ecumenical and Kairos partner, now active in the Emerging Gender, Conflict and Climate Program. Hana conducts trainings for youth and women on leadership, conflict resolution, communication, environmental awareness, and gender-based violence. She was the Middle East representative for the Women Peace Program Working Group in the Netherlands and contributed to a book titled, um, A Force Such as the World Has Never Known, Women Creating Climate Change. Good morning, Hannah, and welcome. Okay, I might have missed that. Can you say something, Hannah? No, I don't think we've got a good audio connection for you. Let's try that again. So I can see that you're unmuted in Zoom but I think something, no. I'm not sure if the other um, interpreters can no. hear. There we go. Sabrina. Much better, Hannah. Yes. <laughs> Good morning and welcome. Okay, so yes. uh, the first question um, is, what do we need to do as Canadians and the international community to address uh, but, uh, Sabrina, I can't hear you well. Your oh. voice is a bit far. Oh, okay. Um, well, to this point, I have just done um, a brief introduction to you. I have not introduced Kelly yet. I'll put the first question in the chat um, and then um, I will, and then we'll go from there. So just give me a okay. quick moment. Did I just, yes. where did it go? Oh, goodness. 
I'm going to ask if one of the support people can put the question in the chat because I seem to have lost that document all of a sudden that I was working off of. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, can you say something now? How about now, Hannah? Yes, now I can hear you. Yes, that's wonderful. Okay, so good. The first question, um, which we are discussing, how how are communities impacted by the climate crisis and this protracted, uh, you know, the protracted conflict areas? Uh, how are communities in the global south, particularly women, affected by it? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, as you know. Uh, in uh, the West Bank, uh, Jerusalem, and Gaza, uh, the situation is totally different than uh, uh, than other countries. Uh, in uh, West Bank, Jerusalem, and uh, Gaza, uh, the, the political situation uh, has its impact on uh, women uh, affected and the community in general affected by climate change. Of course, when we talk about climate change, uh, this means that uh, there is an increase of violent conflict and uh, it creates uh, risks to human security and challenge conflict, recovery and peace building as well. Uh, of course, Palestinians in this context are vulnerable to the impact of climate change and its severe implications on economy and the daily of the life of the civilians as well. Uh, the impact of climate change uh, in the Palestinian territory, including West Bank, Jerusalem, and Gaza, can be clearly seen uh, in the decrease of precipitation, rising temperature, water scarcity, and extreme weather events and rising the sea level. So these are uh, uh, these are the things that really. Uh, touches uh, the community in this uh, area. Uh, of course, when we talk about uh, climate and gender and security, we know that all these components are interlinked. Uh, to add to this, uh, the Palestinian society is considered a, a, a patriarchal society. And of course, because of this, women are affected more by the social norms as well as the customs and traditions of the society uh, in uh, this area. Um, of course, uh, patriarchy hinders women independence and participation in the labor market. And of course, uh, hinders them from holding senior uh, positions. Uh, plus to this, women are really affected by climate change, that they are exposed to risks in health due to increased use of pesticides and bad waste uh, management. Uh, dumping, uh, dumping waste such as sewage waste and dangerous medical waste into Palestinian land causes contamination, and this affects the health of Palestinian civilians um, in large and specifically when we talk about women. Uh, this kind of uh, waste management uh, 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 and uh, untreated sewage, which is discharged into the open land of the Palestinians, into the hills, into the streams, And the, uh, there were like many decades where uh, this dumping hasn't been really controlled. Uh, and this cause, causes, of course, lots of environmental problems, which affects mainly women more than uh, men. Uh, in Palestine, there is also a very limited uh, access to water. water. The water quality and equality is really very, very, very uh, bad quality. And the equality, of course, due uh, to the Israeli control over the uh, water resources is very, very uh, few. Uh, when we talk about water, uh, we can give an example, uh, Gaza, 
where 90% of the water in Gaza is really contaminated, salty, and not fit even for the human consumption. As I mentioned, Israel controls water resources in Palestine and it causes unequal water distribution and scarcity of water. This is a very, very huge problem that people uh, in the community uh, face, of course. Uh, again, when we talk about lack of water, we can say that this hinders the ability of women to develop their agricultural projects when we talk about uh, women working as farmers. Uh, it also hinders their role to irrigate the agricultural crops during heat waves. In addition to this, to the water and to all of this, we can also add that uh, Israel prevents Palestinian women and households from addressing problem of climate change, including lack of water, digging wells, and delivery of equipment and water tanks uh, and water, of course, uh, yes, tank, tanks to many parts of the West Bank. Um, if we talk about the health uh, issues, we know that women um, face and suffer from real uh, diseases and disorders like pulmonary disorders, lung cancer and breast cancer, which has been really increasing among women due to all the poisonous smells, to uh, all the other dumpings and uh, contamination of water. Uh, I would like also to add to this, uh, the presence of uh, uh, the checkpoints and the separation wall, which causes more restrictions of movement to Palestinians in general and to women in specific. Uh, this uh, such uh, like when we, uh, we talk about checkpoints and separation wall, uh, this handles the livelihood and well-being of uh, women when they do engage with different activities. And this causes a very risky environment where these women uh, are, uh, are engaged in. Uh, so we can say that women rights and freedom is continued to be violated by many uh, factors. Uh, also, yes. No, yes, please finish your thought, please. <laughs> Sorry? Please finish your thought, the last ah, thought. Okay, my thought, okay. Uh, yes, so uh, I would like to summarize that the climate change, the heat, the, heat, the cold waves, uh, all uh, these uh, factors really uh, uh, touches women uh, freedom, women uh, development, women capacity building, and uh, uh, their well being and their uh, freedom to movement as well. Uh, so, okay, I can stop here if uh, the time is up. Because there are lots of things that we can uh, talk about Palestinian women. <laughs> yes, I think so. And I think what's very interesting is in hearing back your, your sharing on that, there's so much on what has already been discussed throughout the morning that is yeah. present in what you have just shared. And I think I know that some of the, uh, the Sisters of St. Joseph that are attending uh, this morning will appreciate uh -huh. your pointing out the importance of water. Indeed, everybody here um, yes. uh, will appreciate the importance of water and, and how exactly. sometimes the climate change conversation can overtake the conversation around uh, yes. water rights and water privatization and so many of the mm -hmm. other issues that you've mentioned. I do want to come back, of course, for a larger discussion, but I do want to introduce Kelly and hear her responses on that yes. first question as well. Uh, okay. So Thank Kelly you. Johanna, oh, you're most welcome. <laughs> Kelly Johanna Campo Berchera, a member of the coordinating committee of the Organización Femenina Popular, uh, responsible for the feminist popular economy and environmental programs in Colombia. She is also a leader in the youth movement of OFP. 
with undergraduate studies in chemistry at the Universidad Industrial de Santander Kelly, has also completed a diploma in sustainable economy from the Universidad del Medio Ambiente de Mexico and is pursuing a master's degree in environmental sciences and technology at the Universidad Santo Tomas in Colombia. Born in, and I'm not going to say this correctly, Kelly, so please correct me. Uh, born in Barrancabermeja. Yes, Kelly is committed to constructing spaces for alternative and sustainable economies and Buen Vivir. Please feel welcome to add anything else to your introduction, Kelly. And when you have a moment, your response to the question at hand of how um, these elements are affecting uh, women, particularly women in local communities in the South, uh, Global South, protracted conflict and the climate crisis. Thank you so much, Sabrina. Thank you for that presentation. It's perfect. I'd like to extend my greetings to everyone that is listening to us all. Thank you for your time for participating in this dialogue and sharing with us. There is a lot of conflict in our territories, but as we can see from this morning's panels, it's something that we share in many of our territories. In terms of how climate change affects women and women's bodies and women's lives, it's also important to talk about the social impacts that come from environmental conflicts, particularly in Barranca Bermeja, where we work, where we live here in Colombia, it's a region where there's a lot of extractive activity. There have been a hundred years of oil extraction, a hundred years of extracting resources in our territory. And that brings about all sorts of conflicts, such as the armed conflict, which has been present in our region for more than 50 years and in spite of the peace agreements it continues to be a problem in our region and that fight for land which is a fight for natural resources women are always in the midst of that fight and there's the what we see the feminization of poverty there is an extractive industry that principally contemplates men, where men have more opportunities and economic participation, and a perspective of women that is very different in terms of their opportunities, that women want to find a way to stay in their territory, in their land, and this is land that has been polluted, our rivers have been contaminated, the Magdalene River, which is our main river here, and it goes through our lands, is contaminated because of so many years that they have been discharging oil, there are many extractive and industries that pollute our soils. And all of that has an impact on women who are looking for alternative ways to continue living on these lands. There's a very large social debt that comes from environmental conflict. And there's also a debt in terms of health, specifically women's health. In our region, in Barranca Bermeja, there has been oil extraction for 100 years and, in quotation marks, economic development. But we don't have a regional hospital, for example. We don't have access to health care to take care of women, women's lives and women's health. And in more remote regions, women have to travel for hours just to have a medical test such as a pap exam or any kind of test that women need to take care of their health. When we talk about environmental impacts, we're also talking about social impacts that come from these issues. For us, it's also very important because during these pa past hundred years of oil extraction, we're also seeing effects of fracking and conflicts that are arising from fracking because it has 
disastrous effects on the land and on the water. And we see that it's something that's growing. It's being debated in our country currently if it's something that should be prohibited or not. And there are some pilot projects that are already in place. These are pilot projects that have been approved for fracking in Colombia, in Barranca Bermeja. It's something that worries us a lot because it's there's not only conventional oil extraction, but also fracking because it has a much greater impact on the environment. In many cases, fracking displaces people from their lands in order to be able to create space for their platforms and for their extractive activity. That's something that concerns us very much. And climate change, of course, it's, it's a reality. It's a fact. It affects us all. We don't, only, we don't only want these conflicts to change, but women in these regions are actively creating proposals about how to improve the situation and the conditions in our region. And we're preparing ourselves to address that from a science and a community focus. We talk about empowerment tools so that women can participate in regulation and in decision-making processes. We are proposing environmental alternatives that can mitigate the impacts that we see in our region. That's something that I, I think is important to mention because although there are a lot of conflicts and a lot of impacts, it's also true that the women are actively working and fighting to mitigate those impacts. Muchas gracias, Kelly. Thank you for that. I am. I started listening to you speaking in Spanish. I don't speak Spanish, and then I remembered that we have live interpretation. <laughs> um, thank you to both of you. And you know, I'm really struck at how there is such a strong common denominator between the health of the women in the areas that you are working in and advocating for, and how closely tied in they are to foreign activity. Um, polluting and degradating those natural areas around you. So thank you both for the work that you do and thank you both for sharing uh, these stories with us. I think as uh, Nelson must have mentioned, I think it was Nelson mentioned in the earlier panel, you know, this being a Canadian audience, I think it's a good reminder that there, particularly in South America, there are so many Canadian industries that are behind some of the activities that are that are perpetuating these issues for uh, for, for these areas. So we do, of course, have one more question. And I encourage everyone to put questions in the chat for our two panelists that will be translated and relayed. But the second question to both of you, and you can choose which of you goes first, um, perhaps Hannah as Kelly just finished speaking, but ultimately whomever. And the question to, to, on this topic to, you know, this is about COP27, this is about being in a delegation. So can you share with us what would policies that address the climate crisis, conflict, and gender inequalities look like on the ground? So what are some of the things that will help address these situations that you have described for us? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, yes, if you allow me just to uh, answer this question. Uh, in this regard, of course, uh, there are lots of policies that the Palestinian uh, government has really uh, signed. Uh, uh, there were lots of uh, international conventions uh, as well, like the Rotterdam Convention, like the Paris Agreement and the Stockholm uh, Convention. Uh, of course, the Palestinian Authority and the other organizations, the other uh, organizations that work with women and uh, work with the community as a whole, uh, are aware of the uh, importance of promoting gender equality and the, the environmental issues that affect women uh, and the community uh, in large. 
Uh, also, the Ministry of Women's Affairs has also participated uh, with other civil and international institutions uh, in order to promote uh, climate change adaptation and uh, mitigation as well. Uh, it, uh, of course, also we can't forget about the, the State of Palestine National Adaptation Plan, which is very important in, uh, in this uh, uh, topic. Uh, also, we, can, uh, we, can, we have to mention the importance of the work of the NGOs uh, promoting SIDAO, uh, and especially when we talk about climate change, we talk about Article 14, which has been also uh, a very important uh, topic to discuss in order to raise awareness aw uh, among the community and among women uh, as well. Also, uh, 1325, the UN resolution, which is very, very important uh, to really uh, talk about and uh, uh, conduct workshops <laughs> and try to, uh, try to uh, bring things on the ground regarding uh, this resolution. All of this has been uh, done by uh, uh, the governmental and non-governmental institutions and organizations. But unfortunately, there, there were lots of um, uh, challenges uh, into the adaptive uh, capacity uh, of climate change. Uh, for example, when we talk about uh, uh, the situation uh, within the Palestinian uh, Authority, we can talk about unrevisited uh, policies, uh, about the uh, unrevisited uh, strategies, responses, coordination, and the donor support also is very important in this uh, issue. Uh, also, we talk about the water, the sanitation, the nutrition, all this affects uh, the adaptive uh, capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, again, I would uh, uh, mention, the Israeli occupation, which really uh, reduces the ability of, pro, uh, of producers to respond to any consequences of climate change, land continues to be confiscated for the benefit of the Israeli uh, illegal uh, settlement, regime and annexation and expansion uh, wall. Uh, so all these really uh, hinders the policies that we are trying to really mm -hmm. put on the ground and work with women and uh, the community in large. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah, for, for outlining those pieces for, for us. Uh, Thank you. Kelly, uh, your response to uh, you know, what policies uh, would address the climate crisis, conflict, and gender inequality on the ground for you? Specifically in the case of Colombia, this is a country that has signed so many agreements related to human rights and environmental rights. I don't think there's a lack of policies in our country, but there is a lack of action to follow through with those policies. It, there's a constant struggle in our territories. For example, the Escazú agreement was recently ratified. Now we have to oversee its implement, implementation. Colombia has signed a lot of agreements and a lot of policies, but what is lacking is a follow through with those policies and those agreements. Colombia is part of the ODCE. We are part of the Escusu Agreement, and also regionally, there are autonomous corporations which have created regulation about or regarding economic activity and corporate activity. Uh, 
the idea that the person who contaminates is the one who pays or the entity that contaminates is the one that pays, but that isn't carried out. It's also important for that money to go towards the community to help restore justice and health in those communities. In order for those agreements and those policies to be carried out, the support that we receive from Kairos and from the Canadian Embassy has been and will continue to be essential so that the environmental resources and the well-being of our region and Barranca Bermeja can continue to thrive. That support is very important for us. For example, our participation in international agreements and our dialogue with the international community is also very important for us. Gracias again. Thank you, Kelly, for um, for adding those observations. And again, I can't help but think of these common denominators between what the two of you are describing in terms of the policies and, you know, we can draft the policy, but unless it's followed through with, the, you know, the, hopefully the policy looks pretty on the wall somewhere, right? Um, so I, I can appreciate that we are drawing um, to a close with our time with this gathering today. So I'm going to ask for any uh, questions coming from the audience. And I think I do see one there that I will read aloud, which is might any of the Canadian delegates want to say anything about the enormous so I've, I've seen that question there, but I just want to give a moment to our two panelists at hand. Uh, my apologies, uh, Mr. Davis, and certainly uh, I'm sure people will chime in into the chat. Uh, and thank you, Cheryl, for sharing the information on the third panelist that was meant to join us today. Any final thoughts, Kelly and Hannah, about what this delegate experience, what this delegation will help you to do in your work um, you know, once, you know, I don't want to get too far ahead, but once COP is over and once you're back home after you've had this experience, what are you hoping you will bring from it, uh, from this experience? And this will be a very brief answer as we are drawing the time to a close. Mm -hmm. Kelly, why don't you go ahead and then we'll go to Hannah. Mm -hmm. For us and for our organization, it's the first time that we participate on an event about climate change organized by the UN. We, our organization has existed for 50 years and we focus on defending land and territory. And we've been working on climate change only for a few years. So participating in this space has been very enriching for us and very important. For us, we hope to learn from other experiences and to bring that back with us. We also hope to continue creating networks and links with others. We also have a movement of women activists, women environmental activists. Approximately 300 women participate in this program and they receive training as leaders in terms of education and how to carry out other programs in community science. We'd like to provide a political and economic support for them. That will enable us to support continuity and to continue building and continue mitigating the impacts and to strengthen reforestation in our region and to stay in our territory because that's what we would like to do to continue living in our territory in peace. Thank you very much for that. And Hannah. Oh, unmute. There we go. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, for me, it is really uh, a very, um, a very um, 
exciting experience to uh, come to COP27 and uh, be a delegate uh, with Cyrus Canada. Uh, I would like uh, first to thank uh, you for all the efforts for this, for making this possible, uh, because um, my dream is always uh, to come uh, to COP and participate and bring the voices of the women uh, who are really uh, suffering, who are uh, facing challenges in their life because of the different aspects we have just, uh, I have just uh, mentioned. After the COP27, I would like to come back with lots of information, experience that I gained from the other delegates uh, and to uh, take this into the organization and into the community, to the women, to share with them this and try to work together in order to make change and climate change mitigation possible so that change will happen and people will lives will be different. Especially Thank you. Women. Thank Everyone you. Welcome. You're welcome. Do, do I have it right to say shukran? Shukran, shukran. yes, that's shukran. one. <laughs> shukran yes. and gracias um, to both of you. Thank you. I'm going to turn it back over now to Reverend Snow um, to draw us all back together as a large group and close out this uh, event. Thank you so much. Um, and for all the input and all the uh, presentations, all the uh, research and years of advocacy from all of the panelists and the work that we do here in For the Love of Creation. Uh, it is a continual effort that we uh, put forward and uh, continue to work towards this uh, climate um, advocacy that is very important for our people, for all of the those that are uh, that we are impacted disproportionately and need to find a way to uh, express our voice in this forum. It's going to be very difficult, for, I know, for a number of uh, the uh, uh, groups that are, are going and having been there to see the um, silencing that we that we see through the greenwashing and through uh, the lobbying that goes on, um, it will be frustrating. And I know that uh, a lot of the uh, prayers and well wishes that we bring forward are uh, meant in the... Uh, effort to encourage those that are uh, taking this time and the effort to uh, participate and to take the opportunity from the uh, various groups that have um, stepped forward. I'm just going to, uh, as part of this reflection on, on what we've heard, uh, to read a poem here by N. Scott Mamaday. And as a reminder that a particular segment of our collective existence has drifted beyond the knowledge and wisdom of our origins that makes them see the world as a commodity and that makes them treat the world as merely material to be molded in their image. And this poem that he writes called The Earth is directed towards, I think, a particular audience. It reads, once in life, a man ought to, be, ought to concentrate his mind upon the remembered earth. I believe he ought to be give himself up to a particular landscape in his experience and to look at it from as many angles as he can, to wonder about it, to dwell upon it. He ought to imagine that he touches it with his hands and every season and at every season and listens to the sounds that are made upon it. He ought to imagine the creatures there and all the faintest motions of the wind. He ought to recollect the glare of noon and all the colors of dawn and dusk. For we are held by more than the force of gravity to the earth. It is the entity from which we are sprung and in that into which we are dissolved in time. The blood of the whole human race is invested in it. We are moored there, rooted as surely as, and as deeply as are the ancient redwoods and bristle cones. In this drawing back to connection, it says at the same time, we see you and your disconnection and by your actions you are known. Your path of destruction is evident. Though you have fractured your psyche to create justification and dispensation for your actions, the results still form a path back to you and your beliefs. And it is this reparation, this reconciliation with that which you will be alienated, your earth, their mother, the earth, that brings us to this moment here today 
And through, though you will not repair, know that our path is not yours. Our path is balance. And in the inner workings of creation that lives within us, we are connected and we remain faithful to creation. This notion that um, the difficulty of changing the beliefs of those that are decision makers and trying to uh, put forward positions that are going to affect us all in the future. Uh, it's a very critical time for all of us to be thinking along the lines of what can we do in our own communities. And I'm so proud of the For the Love of Creation and for Kairos for coming together, bringing this message and this idea uh, of hope and of uh, encouragement for a youth delegation to go strongly into this space. So I'm going to uh, first uh, introduce our uh, two speakers here, Aisha Francis from Kairos, the uh, president of, uh, or the, uh, they don't have the information here for me to read quite. Executive director. Executive Director, there you go, uh, for uh, for of Kairos and uh, of Willard Metzger, who is uh, Executive Director of Citizens for Public Justice on behalf of uh, For the Love of Creation. So I will turn it over to uh, Aisha first for her words. Thank you so much, Reverend Snow. And thank you to all the pa panelists today that you have poured so abundantly into all of us with the information and affording us great hope as we um, bless you this morning to go to Egypt as the delegation for COP27. In Ecclesiastes 3, it says, to everything there is a season and a time for every matter or purpose under heaven. This indeed is what we would call a Kairos moment, an opportune time for each of you. As you are set to touch the ground in Egypt for COP27 and prepare your hearts and mind for this moment, I bless you with the courage, tenacity, and resilience, as well as love for creation and justice, hope, wisdom, and deep purpose to plant ideas and strategy, truth and justice, to stand in truth and solidarity, to build others and yourself up, as well as networks, senses of unity, terms of accountability, to speak candidly and prophetically in your own voices, to influence with integrity and intention and lead with confidence, to impact everyone you meet through your authenticity and with your gifts, and to forge the seats for the tables you belong at and pathways where there is yet vision to see and for those who are to follow. May you be guided by the calling of your lives and your fierce convictions, protected in every way, physically, psychologically, and socially from harm, and strengthened inwardly for the rising of your prophetic voices outwardly that are bold and unapologetic and graced with truth, justice, and love. May your Influence and impact in Egypt resonate deeply and be a resounding noise for generations rooted in purpose and love to reveal the nature of God who makes all things beautiful in their time and sets eternity in our hearts and our minds. My favorite scripture is Ephesians 4 1 and it tells me and I share with you to live a life worthy of the calling to which you have received. That is to live a life that exhibits godly character, moral courage, personal integrity, and mature behavior, a life that expresses gratitude to God for your salvation. I bless you all as the COP27 delegation for you have been called for such a time as this. God bless you as you go. Well, let me also add my gratitude and thanks for um for the rich rich presentations today and just to to know that uh, as as aisha says that i mean you carry your voice as individual delegate members but you also or we've also entrusted our voice with you and the 
the presentations um, this morning or today are just give us great confidence that uh, you carry our voice well. So let me let me just offer a prayer of blessing. Creator and sustainer of life, as but a slice of your creation, we honor you as does the rest of creation. As the delegation prepares for COP27, we seek your blessing. Grant a blessing of courage and humility, boldness and peacefulness. Where wisdom is needed, granted in full measure. When silence must be broken, grant a loud voice. When anger must be conveyed, grant a gentle tenacity. And when your hope needs to be fostered, bring a strong sense of your presence. This delegation has been prepared and this work has been initiated because we love you. We love your handiwork. We love your creation. Grant vigor to this love so that the earth and all its inhabitants may feel strengthened. Receive the voice and presence of this delegation as an expression of worship. It is action driven by devotion. This is an act of solidarity for the love of creation, for the love of you as creator. May this worship be a blessing to you as you bless this delegation. Amen. Amen. Thank you both for those beautiful words. I am going to uh, turn to Cheryl uh, McNamara for some announcements before we close the session here. Thank you very much, Tony. And uh, thank you to all of the panelists. Um, it was excellent. Um, and looking forward to what you have to say when you're in COP. Uh, just some very quick announcements. Um, tonight, we invite you to uh, following the voices um, at 5 p.m. Pacific time um, on Turtle Island, which is 8 p.m. Um, Eastern Standard Time. And this is going to be a follow up. Uh, to this event and to accommodate the people living in Western Canada. Uh, this will be a one hour session to discuss how we will follow the delegates uh, throughout their time at COP. Uh, following the voices this evening will be on the same link um, as this event right now. Uh, so you can access it that way. Uh, COP begins this weekend, and the delegates arrive on November 9th. Of course, some like Paul are already there. Be sure to check the Kairos website throughout COP to read all the reports and reflections. Uh, we will be posting also on social media. Uh, I will place in uh, the social media handles uh, for, uh, for the love of creation, Kairos, and a few of the delegates in the chat. And I encourage the Ellen other delegates uh, to place their handles in the chat as well. Um, I'll do that in a sec. Also, um, on November 22nd, please join us uh, for a rescheduled webinar of For the Love of Creations, The Road Past Cop, Spirit and Change with Angela uh, Alouk, I hope I got that name right, and a representative from the Fossil Fuel Nonproliferation proliferation treaty. Um, also, please note that we are going to be planning a follow-up event uh, to this one uh, post-COP 27. It will start at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time like it did today uh, on December 1st. So please mark that in your calendars uh, and we will keep you posted on that. Uh, finally, I just want to make a plug. Uh, we have an advocacy action through Kairos uh, in support of three private members bills in the Canadian House of Commons that will help with just transition efforts. Um, and again, I will post that link in the chat momentarily. Tony, back to you. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who has come uh, for this event and for your attention uh, over the next little while as we hear a number of uh, 
uh, presentations and gatherings will be will uh, be coordinated around uh, COP27 and the work of uh, for the love of creation, for Kairos, and for the partnerships of our interfaith communities that are uh, involved with those um, particular uh, groups. So uh, be sure to um, ensure that you're on our, our mailing list and um, also help to coordinate the, uh, the global action that will be taking place from November 12th, 11th to 13th as well. So um, part of the uh, ongoing work that we will continue to do as communities of faith and as uh, representatives of uh, our various communities in action. And we thank you all for your uh, presence here. It's very important for our work to know that we are reaching out to the community in this way. So thank you. Thank you all. Nice meeting you. Adios, muchísimas gracias. Thank you everyone for coming. Good, goodbye.